Thank you very much. And so I first I'd like to welcome our guest, uh, Mr. Dick Batchelor, who's a former legislator and a longtime child advocate in the state of Florida. Thank you so much for joining us, Dick. Thank it's you, great Debbie. to have you. Thank you, Debbie. I appreciate it. Wonderful. So you have done so much work in the state of Florida, helping vulnerable populations, helping children. What made you interested in working in the opioid crisis? As a former legislator, I've been involved in a lot of issues. I remember years ago, I rewrote the Baker Act, which is the Mental Health mm -hmm. Act, and, and led an effort to close some institutions where we were basically warehousing people with issues like mental health issues. And so it's always been a passion of mine. But uh, the honest and goodness truth is uh, my youngest sister, I had two sisters, one died of cancer, but one died, they said of a heart attack, but she really didn't die. It was induced by opioids. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure that story too often, but she lived in Baltimore, Maryland, and uh, her doctor prescribed her 120 opioids wow. um, at one time, and she got addicted, and she went through them in 30 days, and that's, if my math is correct, that's for a day. Wow. Uh, you know, uh, Oxycontin, and then I would get calls from her. She needed money, and... Uh, then she would go downtown Baltimore at two o'clock in the morning, get back home, uh, lost, and she was actually buying them on the street. She was addicted. The prescriptions by the physicians, uh, and uh, not not unlike a lot of people, millions of people, mm -hmm. uh, those opioids that were been prescribed 120 at a time, people got addicted right, right. to them, and so she was buying it on the street. Yeah, and uh, so she. She was found dead in bed by her uh, significant other, mm. and they said it was a heart attack, but it was really induced by opioids. Yeah. So the reason I'm, my passion is so strong here is not just a public policy issue, which sounds very generic, right. it really is a personal issue. And then how do you communicate to people that they really need to get help? I failed, I feel like I failed with my sister. I tried and tried and tried, but she was an addict. Right. She was addicted to opioids, so it's hard to convince her that she wasn't and that she, the addiction was a lot uh, stronger than her brother's personal persuasion, and she died. Right, absolutely. And opioids, we know, is an incredibly addictive substance. So even just beginning to take them from a physician can really begin people to to get um, addicted and and start to use too many. Yeah, and, and, and also in public policy or in advocacy, I always say, you, you can look at the statistics. We know that uh, the overdose deaths of opioids mm -hmm. in Orange County has been 6% up. Right. Uh, overall, Hispanic population is up even higher than that. And the African-American population is well over 125%. Mm -hmm. Deaths, not just overdoses, but deaths mm -hmm. uh, from overdoses. So I always say you put a face on it. Yeah. You can Absolutely. take all the statistics every day you want to. And you can turn all the reports you want to. Mm -hmm. And you can look at, the, and they're sterile, but put a face on it. My sister's face is put on my reason for being involved in the opioid project. Thank you, Dick. Thank you for sharing that with us. I know how, how hard that must be and how passionate you are and have been with regard to helping people. You've made your life cause of that and we greatly appreciate it. You know, so many people are in need of help and they can often reach out to Aspire by calling 407-875-3700 to get the help that they need. The other thing is, I know you've done so much with families and children. Mm -hmm. And the pandemic has brought a whole different world in terms of people getting help. Yeah. What would you say to family members and to parents and to friends who need to reach out because they know somebody who is using opioids or other substances? The first thing they need to hear is it's okay. It's okay to ask for help. Uh, my sister didn't, unfortunately, we, even though it was offered to her. But if you've got a family member, it could be a parent or it could be a child. Mm -hmm. uh, if you know that they're involved with opioids and abuse, and then it's what's worse, and I know you've talked about it before many, many times, and you can relate to it, it aspires is that so many opioids now are spiked with fentanyl. Right, right. Fentanyl is over 100 times more powerful than heroin. And it will kill you. Mm -hmm. it, it will kill you. So if you've got a, a family member who's got an opioid issue, you know, don't be fearful of asking for help. They need help. So you need to get them help the best way you can. Unfortunately, we've got community resources like Aspire. We can get 
some help, some professional help, and hopefully address the addiction issue and save a life. I mean, again, I mean, I said uh, in the beginning, the statistics are very abstract and clinical and kind of sterile, but 50, what 60% of the more deaths, again, not just overdoses, but deaths from overdoses mm -hmm. is really, really important. So put, put a face on it. That face might be uh, your mom, it could be your dad, it could be your child. But put a face on that, it's not a statistic, put a face on that and say, it's okay to ask for help and then find the resources in the community. And there are resources in our community to get that help you need. You're saving a life. You're not just getting somebody unaddicted, if I might use that term, you're actually saving a life of a loved one. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's such an important call to action that you can save the life of your loved one. This is a medical condition, right? This is treatable. Yes, right. There are medications out there right. that can help us overcome this. Right. And so what would you say to, you know, an individual who's worried about um, the, somebody might think badly of them because they can't just stop taking their drugs. What, what can we say to that person? Again, I think you've got to personalize that again, put a face on it. It's really not, I really don't care what other people think. Frankly, <laughs> I really care about, am I going to save the life of my mom or my dad or my daughter or my son? And I've got a number of cases, uh, personal cases in Orange County where people have lost their children uh, to overdoses. Yeah. So it's, it's, again, it's not a statistic. Right. It's not some book that you read. Right. It's right. not some right. podcast you heard necessarily. It's not some movie that you saw. These are real living people. Uh, your loved ones. So you're really, again, I would ask people to focus, focus on making it personal. Mm -hmm. It's your child, it's your mom, it's your dad. It's okay to ask for help. In fact, it's necessary to ask for help because the option is death in many, right. many cases. Yeah. This isn't one, one of those things that most people can just pull themselves up and get through. You need help. You need professional help. And from places like Aspire here locally, where you can call and you can get that help 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's called addiction for a, a reason. I know that you've right. had one of your old staff members, Houston, yeah. on the uh, presentation before and what he's going through, but he survived and he's thrived. And uh, that's what it's all, it's really all about is just that, you know, what is, you know, do, do, it's an addiction. You have to remind yourself it's an addiction. Right, it's right. not like you can go to somebody and say, well, let's just be candid about this and let's just be open about this and let's be dispassionate about this. Right. It's, well, you've got to be passionate about it because, it, again, it's an addiction. Uh, they, it's not like they're getting self help. They need help mm -hmm. and they need professional help and they need to support the family to do it. And it's, it's not easy. It's an addiction. Right. It's very, very difficult. Right. Well, and it's a disease. I mean, it's when we disease. look at it, this is a disease of the brain, right. and we know that it's something that we need to work at to cure like any other disease. And there's medication that's available to help people with opioid addictions right. that they can become better and functional. Mm -hmm. um, I love your passion with regard to be a voice, get yeah. out there and, and help others, and particularly, you know, be that advocate, reduce the stigma because as we see so many people, particularly those that have the addiction or dependence, mm -hmm. they don't see when they're in it that they need to be able to reach out for help, but their loved ones, family members, peer, teachers, everybody around them is seeing that. Mm -hmm. So your message is very clear to reach out for that help, reach to aspire, reach to other components mm -hmm. within the community mm -hmm. to be able to get the help that you need. During this pandemic, this what they call environmental conditions or situational situations uh, where, you know, the family might have lost their job, or let's say the breadwinner loses their job and there's a situation in the household. It's not like it used to be pre-pandemic. Right, some people, exactly. That's why you see so many deaths. So people being isolated, children not being able to go to school, they can't socialize. Mm -hmm. So there's it's a lot of compounding effects. So it's not an excuse, but it's a reason uh, that it happens. But you deal with the reason and you deal with it uh, just forthright and honest about it. And just to really, again, uh, say you, you need to get this help.
then yeah. we think the statistics right now are even underreported mm -hmm. because of what you just said, because of the isolation, right. because there's so many people that are struggling that aren't reaching out for help. Mm -hmm. And every day it's becoming a co-occurring issue because of the pandemic with regard to anxiety, depression. Mm -hmm. And then we also have people that are taking care of their children and they're taking care of their parents and other mm -hmm. family members that might be having an addiction and then feel like they can't turn for the help because of the pandemic, because of coming into services, right. but yet we're here to help. You made the point, ask for that yeah. help, get that help so that you can be productive. I don't think people intentionally say, I'm gonna wake up one morning and I'm gonna start taking an Oxycontin person. Right, example. absolutely. And I'm intentionally gonna be an addict and I'm gonna teach you put my life at risk and I'm gonna teach you be maybe exposed to fentanyl, you know, which is a poison in itself. Uh, they don't do that. So there are situational and environmental issues that contribute to that. Right. But again, it, it, that's why you've got, you've got to offer the help. You've got to be a support group. You've got to be a family. Whether, when I say family, that beyond that which is beyond your immediate family. It could, be, it could be a neighbor. It could be a coworker, whatever. The community but as again, a whole. I, think, mm -hmm. and I know I'm being redundant and apologize, but I think you basically got to say it's okay to get help. You know, just yeah. confess make a strong word, admit uh, that you have a problem and say, you know, I need the help, I'll accept the help. And, but uh, the resources are there, so there's no reason somebody shouldn't, there's no reason for somebody to be addicted. Uh, and there's a lot of public policy issues we've all right. discussed before that need of to course. be changed. And there are the legal multi-billion dollar lawsuits against the pharmaceutical company, Big Pharma, for intentionally getting in people. And there was a story of a small city, a small town that was not even a city in West Virginia where 10,000 people is all they were. There were millions, millions of opioids prescribed in that community. And guess what happened? They were addicted. Right. Because Big Pharma got them addicted intentionally. And they're going to pay a price for it now. But the price they pay, no matter how many billions of dollars is, they can never replace the lives that were lost to addiction. So don't let big pharma, don't let big brother, if you want to call it that, dictate who you are and what you want to be. Don't let a drug become addicted to you or you become addicted to the drug. And uh, to win that battle, you know, take it on and kind of, you know, buck it up and say, look, you know, I'm, I'm taking on the drug company or I'm taking on the provider. Uh, I'm going to take on whoever tries to put my life at risk or a family member's life at risk. You have to win this thing, but you buck it up and say, look, it's okay to get help. Let me have help. Work with me. I do not want to be an addict. I do not want to die. Right. You know, I do want to survive. This is the time to stand up for yourself, to stand up for your family and really go out and try to get that help. And right. I want to mention that Aspire, the help that Aspire offers, it does you don't have to go in to a facility to get help with Aspire. Right. Do so many different things through telehealth means, through telepsychiatry calling in and again, 407-875-3700 to get an assessment and to be linked into services. Mm -hmm. What, and it doesn't matter if you have a resource, we're here for you. Yeah. As Dick indicated, it's okay to get help. You need to be able to reach out for yourself, for others, for your family members, because that's how we're gonna make a difference. And while the pandemic has been here and we're all working towards lessening the COVID crisis, we certainly wanna make sure that we're also focused on the opioid epidemic. And Project Opioid has absolutely put that as a forefront so we can continue to do that in our community. Your leadership on Project Opioid has made a huge difference with what you bring to the community with your legislative background as well as your child advocacy. I know that there's kids and other listeners that are out there just thinking about, okay, I wanna reach out, but I'm afraid. What is gonna happen? How are things gonna, how am I gonna get the support? What are my families gonna think? If I do reach out and I run into um, potential issues, what happens with law enforcement? Mm -hmm. We have parents that call us regularly. I know they reach out to Kendall as well, mm -hmm. moms, dads, others, looking for help for their children and they need to know that it's okay. What would you say to some of those that want to go ahead and, and reach out and maybe are fearful as to what might happen after they reach out? It's not in the business arresting people over and over again. The crime, addiction is not a crime. <laughs> you know, some people unfortunately act out after they're addicted and commit crimes, but addiction itself is not a crime. One of my favorite sayings is such is the irresistible nature of truth that all it wants and all it asks 
his ability to be heard. Well, the truth is some people are addicted. And uh, I think Babette um, uh, uh, kind of inferred this, and that is that there's collateral damage. The addiction is not affecting one person. Right. The whole family unit is affected. And particularly if there's a funeral involved, and again, excuse me for being blunt, but if there's a funeral involved, it affects the whole family for generation after generation. So again, I think Kendall and Babette have said it very, very clearly. Don't be afraid to ask about Law enforcement is not interested in arresting you for your addiction. We're only interested in identifying those people who have an addiction who won't help. So, you know, uh, irresistible nature of truth. Just the truth is, if you have an addiction, don't be afraid. Don't be bashful. Don't be embarrassed to ask for help because it's not just help for you. If you're a child, let's say, collateral damage or your siblings, your brothers and your sisters and your mom and your dad. So addiction is not a solo exercise. Addiction is, affects many, many people, including your friends. I mean, I've talked to a number of friends, again, who've lost people uh, to addiction and overdose of, of opioids. So again, don't be afraid to ask for help. It's, it's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength that you want to be not what the drug dictates you or who you are, but you want to be who you are. So have that liberty, have that challenge, have that, you know, oomph to get up and say, I'm going to, I'm going to win this thing. I'm going to win. I have to win. And I'm not the victor alone. My mom, my dad, my brothers, my sisters, my grandparents, and my friends are the victims. Mm -hmm. So it's not a, it's not a solo, solo mm -hmm. act. Mm -hmm. What are some cool things that you think are happening with Project Opioid that you've been involved in? Well, first of all, I'm very impressed that the business community has gotten mm -hmm. so engaged. Ken Lopdrop, the CEO of Red Lobster, and a whole host of business people in the faith community has gotten involved. So I'm very, very impressed with how people have come together to respond. In this community, we're very fortunate because no matter the issue of homelessness or whatever it might be, you can find the communities willing to come together, not just for an exercise of doing a study, solely to do a study, but really to understand the problem, identify the problem, more importantly, identify remedies to the problem. So I'm very impressed that this community has come together and say, we care, we don't care about opioid projects. You know, we care about that life mm -hmm. that we're going to help rescue right. in some way. Absolutely. And that life that we're going to try to save in some way. So the community is not coming together just because it's the time the issue. Mm -hmm. It's just not the flavor of the week, right? right. Opioids is a very, a very important problem. So I've been very, very impressed with how the community has come together mm -hmm. and the health community and others to say like, we're a team here. We've got a challenge in this community and how do we address the challenge? And again, we're very fortunate, not only because of that leadership, but we're lucky that law enforcement is involved in the side of trying to find help right. for these people rather than not, not rest people. And uh, we're lucky that uh, the community is coming together again for an end in sight. The end in sight is to help people who have a problem, who won't help, who need help, and provide the help. And we have the resources to this fire to do that. Absolutely, Dick. I couldn't have said it better myself. The the uh, reaction we've gotten from our business community has been overwhelming mm -hmm. and has really taken this on as a public health mm -hmm. crisis, the public health crisis that it is. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've talked a little bit about the impact that it's had on children. And I think we should really reiterate, especially if you are a woman who is, is pregnant and is, is using that there are options um, if you're using opioids while you're pregnant, because we do know there are some long-term right. implications, yeah, absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah. And then again, I can tell you, and it's not uh, restricted to a lot of times people who might not be knowledgeable about this addiction, mm -hmm. you know, and say, well, it's, it's them right. or it's them or it's that neighborhood. No, on one hand, I can tell you, Biff Lowe, which is a very low income company uh, uh, section of the county, mm -hmm. has probably the highest death rate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I'll also tell you that I have friends, one was a CEO of a Fortune 500 company, lost yeah. a son. Uh, the other one was uh, uh, owns a band daughter yeah. company. Right, lost a daughter. So believe me, uh, opioids and addiction, they don't discriminate. No, absolutely, they don't right discriminate. In any social economic group that you're in, no matter what race you are, no matter what color you are, no matter what social economic strata you're in, addiction doesn't care. No, it's absolutely. a very brutal, vicious, absolutely addiction. Mm -hmm. 
So we need to be uh, all these communities and again with the opioid project are involved in bringing the communities together, all communities together to fight this addiction because it is a battle. Right. It is a battle. Yes. Well, and, and I think you make some great points. It touches everybody. Right. Absolutely. And it, it nobody is immune from addiction. Right. There's not a vaccine for it right. like right. we're doing with regard to COVID. And that's mm -hmm. super important. Mm -hmm. You know, I continue to listen to what you're saying and your your words are very powerful because I hear you say, you know, you need to advocate and educate. Absolutely. Advocate for the help, educate others of what's right. happening, be a voice. Right. Yeah. Make sure you get out there and talk about it. Be a voice so that we can educate others and make a difference and then collaborate. Look right. at what's out there. If it's you're collaborating with family members, you're collaborating. And right. as Dick indicated, family being even greater than your immediate family members, your community, everybody else. If we look at it, it's really the ABCs of how do we help people, right? right? You advocate, you be that voice and you collaborate. Right. And, you know, I, I greatly appreciate you saying that because you've dedicated so much of your life to making a difference and making sure we're saving lives. And we recognize that and we can learn from it. And your message is very powerful for our listeners and for those that are needing help. Well, one thing you mentioned the word advocacy, that, and, but it occurred to me, a sibling can be an advocate. My mom and Absolutely. dad- Absolutely. 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 Your friend have an addiction, you can be their advocate. You could mm -hmm. actually save their life. Mm -hmm. You know, So anyone can be empowered to be an advocate. If you need to call and offer them help and tell them where they can get the resources for right. help. Do that. Be the advocate for your brother, your sister, your mom, your dad, or vice versa, or your best friend. Because look, when you say, again, I'll go back to statistics of uh, whether 60% increase in number of deaths and overdoses, mm. you know, those are funerals, right? right. Those are funerals. Right. That's when you had the mom and the dad and the brothers and the sisters and the grandparents and the aunt and uncles and your best friends stand there and say, what could I have done? Well, what you could do is that you can advocate. You don't have to be well informed on this issue to advocate. Just say, I love you. You have an issue. You have a problem. You have an addiction. There are resources available. You can be cured of this, of this very, very uh, tough disease. You can be cured of it. And I'm here to advocate for you. I'm here not to bug you. I'm not here to harass you. I'm not here to incite you. I'm here to excite you that you have a friend who cares and loves you and that we want to really get you help. We want to, in the end, possibly save your life. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, thank Dick you. Bachelor, for being with us today. Um, you've given us a lot to think about and thank you so much for sharing you. your personal story. So um, that's all for today's episode. Thank you for, from me, Dr. Kendall Ward and my co-host, uh, Babette Hankey from thank Aspire you. Health Partners.